Welcome everybody to Playwrights Workshop Montreal, Demystifying Dramaturgy. <laughs> Thank you for coming out and helping us figure out what dramaturgy is for this community. Um, it's really great that you're all here. My name is Emma Tibaldo. I'm the Artistic Director of Playwrights Workshop Montreal. I would like uh, to start by giving a land acknowledgement. Um, PWM is located on unceded Kanyegehaga territory. Jojaga. Jojaga. I'm so sorry. Jojaga, uh, broken to, uh, is and always will be and always has been a meeting place for First Nations. And we, as Playwrights Workshop Montreal and everyone who works here, are uh, very grateful that we have the opportunity to work and create here and share stories. So thank you very much. Um, for being here with us tonight. Um, I invite you to press government uh, to adopt the 94 calls to action that are found in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And please, um, as, as part of the giving for the season, um, to donate to an Indigenous organization that is close to your heart. Um, the um, Native Women's Shelter of Montreal is close to my heart. So if you have the opportunity and the means, please think about uh, donating at this time. I am so grateful that you're all here uh, to our three beautiful guests. And I don't mean that because they're beautiful, but because they are <laughs> extraordinary human beings. So grateful that you're here with us. And Jesse Stong uh, will present the event. Uh, and so I hand it over to dramaturg Jesse Stong. And I'd like to also thank Sorry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I do this all the time. That uh, um, you're welcome to come and go as as you please. Please feel free to leave and come back. There's no restriction in going out and coming in. And if you need any help with anything, just let us know. Uh, the bathrooms are around the corner. Uh, the doors are open for everybody to use at any time. And also, if you find a blue wallet, um, it has been lost, disappeared. Um, it belongs to Ketalin and her Hungarian ID is in it. So uh, if you find it tonight, please let us know. Appreciate it. Jesse? I have to stay here with you. Uh, so if you don't find it, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hi, everybody. So welcome to a night of getting dramaturgical. Uh, I was going to say this, bathrooms around the corner, that was my job. <laughs> and the bathrooms around the corner normally need a key, there's no key today. There's two bathrooms, they're assigned genders, but you can ignore them. Um, every day. <laughs> I ignore them every bathroom trip. And then also there's a quiet space in Leslie's office, which is like the corner office right there. Um, there's some couches, some yoga mats, if you feel like you're overthought or if you just want to rest or for any reason, please feel free at any point to rest and think and be in that room quietly. Heather and Leslie are here. Are Heather and Leslie here? You can raise hands. I'm, uh, I'm here. And Leslie's coming back. They're the assigned support people, so if you feel like you want to stop and have a one-on-one -on -one, or you need anything at all, like extra cream for your coffee or anything, just go to them. I don't know if that's actually on the menu. Um, anything you need, please feel free to speak to them, or to myself, or to Emma. Um, we're filming just the three presentations, so you see a camera here, but we're not going to film any of the discussion, just so you know. Uh, the discussion period is going to be mediated. We're going to tell you what we're talking about, so don't panic or start thinking yet. Well, you can start thinking, obviously. Um, and, uh, Josh, where's Josh? Sorry. Joshua Jackson is over here. Josh Johnson is our intern and our and he's documenting and doing a summary, a blog summary of the discussion. But he's not going to quote anybody specifically or say anything like if something's like very emotional or something gets talked about and we agree that we want to keep it in the room, it'll stay in the room. Uh, last but not least, it's our fundraiser right now, the Impact Creation Fundraiser, Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday? What does that mean? Oh, today is Giving Tuesday, so <laughs> anyone who, if you donate more than $25, for every $25 you donate, Canada Helps will donate $5 in addition. So you don't have to donate today, you can donate any time this week, but today's a great day for it. Um, and yeah, so today we're here to talk about dramaturgy. I don't want to say too much to bias the conversation and the discussion, and also there's three amazing prepared presenters who are going to say more than me. Um, I just want to say that I love stories, 
and that I didn't think I was going to become a dramaturg. It was unexpected, life turn, like many dramaturges. But um, I love storytelling. I love. I have a deep respect for artists, and I think that's why a lot of you are here as well. The love of story, the love of art making. So we want to keep that energy going forward. To me, dramaturgy is about radical listening. So let's bring that radical listening into the room today and listen to each other as well as speak. Um, we're going to do the three presentations, 15 minutes each. Is that what we said? Yes? Sorry. Great. And now we're going to do a five, ten minute break before we break into three groups. But after the break, come back here and we're going to let Tiffany explain the activity before we separate. So you'll take five minutes, do your thing, bio break, smoke, whatever you do. And then you'll come back here. So I'm going to get started. We're going to start with Diane Roberts. Is that cool? I thought we were starting <laughs> so Diane Roberts is an artist, a director, a dramaturg, a cultural animator, a PhD candidate at Concordia. Um, they're going to talk about decolonizing the dramaturgical process. Um, the Arrivals Legacy Project is the work they've been doing for over 16 years. And it's about using, it's drawing on ancestry from a point of inspiration for creation. Yeah. I kind of paraphrased you, but that's about it. So give it up for Diane. project that, um, well, you've heard, the Arrivals Legacy Project. Um, it's a project that I started 16 years ago, actually as a, a course. I was teaching an introduction to acting class, and I invited uh, the participants of that class, the incoming students, to embody an ancestor two or three generations away. I asked them to... <laughs> I asked them to write an outline of this um, ancestor, uh, to choose a compelling moment in this ancestor's life, and to find, um, a, a, through researching, using um, their uh, family resources, as well as um, archives, um, historical documents, etc., to really try and um, get inside what that compelling moment is. And we talked about that moment being um, uh, a moment of uh, critical time in their lives. So a decision that had to be made, or leaving home, for example, or um, leaving the country, leaving their homeland. Um, and so uh, we would ask them, or I would ask them to uh, narrow this moment down to the hour, the minute, the second. So that breath of is it when the door closes behind me and I know that I'm not going to be able to go to turn around and go back home? Is it seeing the land disappear in front of me as I look over the ship, the, the bow of the ship? Um, is it going off to war or, or getting married in that moment of saying yes? Um, so uh, Students took on this challenge, and uh, I gave them three objects and three uh, words that they could use. So it was um, an exercise about presence. How do you create story without going blah, 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 I am this, I, you know, all the, the trappings of conversation. So it was through gesture, through a complete embodied moment in time. And uh, it was really profound um, what came back as I read their journals um, talking about that process. They talked about this opportunity for um, family members to speak to each other that hadn't spoken to each other in a long time. They spoke about the ancestor they chose was the ancestor that they seemed to have needed in that moment in time. And um, looking at resonances, but wait a second. I really love this, and my ancestor really loved doing this, and there's this connection. So there was this sort of line that was drawn between them 
um, and uh, their past, at, which gave them a deeper grounding in their uh, feet. Um, so I just want to read a little bit uh, about uh, the arrivals process and some of the discoveries that I made through that. Um, sorry, after the uh, uh, university um, course, I went off into the world and started more collaborating with artists. And I focused, um, my focus was mainly on um, indigenous artists and racialized artists to, to really talk about um, or to find those moments of um, the gaps that exist in, in the archives <laughs> um, um, when we're trying to source our own stories. Um, I wanted to address this idea of the silences that we, we, we tend to have to navigate as we're trying to recreate stories or recreate histories. So the arrivals legacy process enacts an approach to collaborative responsibility that is geared toward particular centers of gravity that are rooted in the body and infused by the spirit. We carry a legacy. When we carry our own weight, we carry our full potential. Our bodies naturally make images consciously and unconsciously, and this is not only for communication, but in response to our environment, our history and experience, our needs and desires. When we create story from these images, we increase our ability to see and capture them in space and time. When we, when we put ourselves into a situation where and when our creative bodies and breath and voice and mind can thrive, a state of letting go, we begin to tap into an abundant source of inspiration. Through arrivals, we collectively and individually reclaim gestures that give us a sense of deep knowing, valuing the wisdom of embodied archives in di dialogue with written archives. We consider the process of landing. We witness ourselves through our chosen ancestor, who in the process of landing might reconstruct new identities. We trace ruptured knowings and develop new ways of seeing ourselves in another, ourself in another's land. We weave a new kind of knowing. In the environmental movement, we learn to reduce our carbon footprint. In ceremony, we learn that we must deepen our footprint, step fully into our stories, and let them unfold around us. And so the goals of the, the arrivals work is to um, help performers to learn skills in grounding, listening, authentic exploration of space, increased body knowledge, and character development. For writers and creators, Creators, they learn to tap into their creative source through embodied research, exploring personal and collective histories. I wasn't going to go through the six stages of the arrivals process, but I don't think I will. Um, I think what I'd like to talk about a little bit, if I still have five minutes or so, is um, projects that have sort of come out of the arrivals work and, and, and how it's manifested in itself into artistic creation. For me, dramaturgy isn't just about the piece or the story or the emerging stories, but it's about the vessel through which these stories come out, emerge. So when I'm working with artists in developing their stories, it's not necessarily about, okay, I gotta get that play done, and then I'm gonna go get that play produced, and then I'm gonna be a big star. <laughs> it really is about what is what is what are the stories I'm telling? How do I find my feet in the telling? And where do I find the source of those stories? The um, the the uh, I guess guiding principle of the work is that these stories are in our bodies, whether we like it or not. And we've seen this sort of repeated or to us in, in um, science more recently in epige epigenetics where they say, you know, that the, they finally caught up with indigenous knowledges um, where the scientists are now saying, oh, wow, the stories of our ancestors are in our bodies, you know, and they show up as disease sometimes. They show up as, as um, uh, 
a disquieted um, nature, or they might show up in a joyful nature. Um, so um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is uh, a project that is very much about how we cross those histories, how we cross those boundaries um, that are uh, really, really challenging to cross. Um, how, do, how does my ancestor meet your ancestor in space? And how do we actually bring those stories to life without damaging each other? Um, and also telling the truth, honoring our ancestors. So one of the projects I'm working on called The Art of Peace is engaging um, artists from different cultural backgrounds who are interweaving the stories and histories that, um, that are in their own bodies and trying to find ways for those stories to intersect with each other, to speak to each other. And, um, and in some cases, that can be quite explosive. And so we have to sort of figure out how to, what are our shared protocols and what are our shared values around breaking open those stories? How do we take care of each other? How do we witness story in another person, knowing that perhaps we may have been on the other side of that story and not in such a good way? How do we, how do we move together in a good way without creating the project of multiculturalism that is a myth, you know, um, that we've inherited in the Canadian project. So, so we're, we're, we're continually turning over questions that um, are delicate and highly charged and political <laughs> and trying to create a space where those crossings can exist. Um, both in a ceremonial way as well as in a political and a practical and a, and a story generating way. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, go, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have Kotlin Trenteni, Trenteni, sorry, dramaturg and researcher based in London. She has a specialization in contemporary theater performance, new dramaturgy, multimodal play development, and European director theater, director's theater, but we're not talking about European here. Uh, we're talking about uh, styles that she has learned from her time studying and living in Hungary, um, Hungarian style of dramaturgy and also talking about macro dramaturgy and how it relates to the thoughts and role of the dramaturge. Okay? Um, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for having me here. It is a great pleasure and a great honor to share this space with you. There's a little correction I'd like to make. I'm not going to talk about Hungarian style of dramaturgy. I just thought that if my carbon footprint is this big, flying all over from London to Montreal, I would take this opportunity to, to share with you practices from Hungary. Uh, instead of talking about my own practices, I'm bored of doing that. I, I, would, I, would, I would use this opportunity to give a platform to, to Hungarian theatre makers and, and professionals who, about whose work you may not have heard of, but whose values I share. So, just to clarify, I don't work with them, I respect them hugely, and I thought it's, it's important to, to, to talk about their work. And, um, and I will also talk about macro dramaturgy, and I will, I will explain what, what uh, I understand. Uh, under this term. So, 
um, I, I define dramaturgy not only as a, as a critical practice, but also as a social practice. And uh, I feel that we, as theatre makers, we, we don't work in a vacuum, but we are part of uh, various communities. We are, we are uh, a, a, a theatre production is not realized uh, in a vacuum. It's, uh, the theatre is in, inside uh, or serving the community. The community is, uh, is in a city uh, that is part of a culture. Uh, and, and these are these concentric circles around our production and our dramaturgical thinking. And I think it's worth acknowledging that and think about that. So think about the larger picture, and that's macro dramaturgy. So, so dramaturgy uh, uh, is. Uh, or, or, or micro dramaturgy is focusing around one particular production, whereas macro dramaturgy is zooming out and and, and, and looking at uh, the larger context, the, the society, uh, the role that particular organization plays in, in in the society, and our responsibility in, in, in that society. Um, the the actual term. Uh, of macro dramaturgy, it was uh, coined by uh, 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 the late Flemish dramaturg Marion van Kerkhoven, who, uh, who in an essay that she wrote exactly 25 years ago, she uh, she she defined or, or came up with these terms. So she said that we could define the micro dramaturgy as that zone, that structural circle which lies in and around the production, but the production comes alive through its interaction, through its audience, and through what is going on inside its own orbit. And around the production lies the theater, and around the theater lies the city, and around the city, as far as we can see, lies the whole world, and even the sky, and all its stars. The walls that link all these circles together are made of skin. They have pores. So, I consider dramaturgy as a, as a socially conscious, critical practice, and it's a relational practice because I'm, as a dramaturg, we are in dialogue with, 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 with theatre makers, with organisations, with festivals, with, with playwrights, with directors, with, with choreographers, and, and, I, and our role is uh, subsequently nurturing and challenging, nurturing and challenging uh, the artistic endeavour, uh, the journey making decision through the process. So what's happening during a production process, we, we start uh, with our investigation, we have some questions, and, uh, and then as the, the, uh, as the process progresses, our, our questions change, and, uh, and our role as dramaturgs, or my role as a dramaturg, is to highlight uh, highlight the consequences of our decisions and we answer those questions and uh, and where those where those roads may may, may lead to um, so uh, I'm, I'm asking questions about the structure and composition of the product but more importantly about the working process because I, I, I believe that that the process the way we work has a huge impact Product, what we create, the play, the, the performance, the festival. So I'm asking questions about structure and composition, networks and relationality, methodological concerns, questions about intention, intuition, agency. And this is a quote from Sandra Nerf, uh, uh, a German dramaturg whose work I respect. It means, the, dramaturg and theorist, it means dealing with our politics of decision and our protocol. Uh, so, dramaturgy, uh, I, as many other practitioners, I, 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 uh, I uh, respect, regard dramaturgy as a function as not a role, and not a role. So you, as uh, theatre makers, you might find yourself in, 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 in a role when you are doing dramaturgy. 
and, uh, and it's a shared practice of understanding. I'm again quoting Sandra Lamar, uh, perspectivating and tracing of positioning and repositioning in artistic, but also in social and political terms, as a practice that exercises resistance to too easy images and forward-oriented logics, and that addresses strategies and processes of responsiveness, hesitation, and affirmation in our actions and encounters. As a practice that is not limited to the verse entrance in front of a public, as a practice that does not belong to anyone. Um, there's one more theoretical term, and I, I talk about productions, I promise. Uh, but before uh, I, 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 I get to this, uh, the work of these professionals. I, I'd like to introduce the term of action research. You, you, you might be familiar with that. Uh, Chemist and MacTaggart's work from the 1950s. It's a form of collective self-reflective uh, inquiry undertaken by the participants in social situations in order to improve the rationality and justice of their own social and educational practices as well as their understanding of these practices and the situations in which these practices are carried out, i.e. using uh, an, an action research uh, has also a strand that, that is uh, art-based action research uh, with the same aim of empowering people through this. So the, the, the organization whose work I'd like to talk about is called Shoyat Sinhas. Uh, and it's it's a platform for social uh, platform art for social change. So it's a loose uh, 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 how I call it a loose network of various organisations and professionals and artists. And it and it sprang up from a research project, and then and then it it, it grew. Uh, it, uh, the, the the various organizations are uh, in, in this network. They, they are artistic, educational, and social organizations, and and uh, working together with local communities. And in, in the case of Shayat Sinhas, which means their own theater or own theater, uh, they they work with with the with the Romani or Gypsy communities in, in Hungary, and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how familiar you are with with, uh, with, the, uh, with, with Hungarian politics, uh, but uh, this is quite a sore point because uh, um, uh, if I say that the current government is, is abandoning uh, Romani uh, people, I think this this was an, this was a euphemism. And uh, so, and, and, and the question of the problems these communities fa are facing are the also familiar problems of social deprivation, poverty, unemployment, uh, alcoholism, etc. Does it ring yeah. a bell of, of problems of marginalized communities? So this, this uh, network of, of various uh, cultural, educational, art organizations and also uh, a network of researchers, uh, a cultural anthropologist, a photographer, uh, theater and education organization. They, they came together to, to, to empower the, these people and uh, so through various, various projects. Um, but the methodology they use is this, this uh, uh, action research. So, empowering the community through, through action research. So the various areas of this logo, the, the I, and they have different platforms. So for instance, they, they publish books, which uh, they make available open access on their website. So it's a research project as well as, as an educational project and, and, and empowering educators and, and also sharing the knowledge. Uh, they also have uh, educational projects, 
they, uh, they also have a, a theater strength, they do workshops, and uh, it is a very intricate cobweb, the relationship between these organizations, because they, they may run workshops that they, which later develop into art projects, uh, they work in, in, in different communities, uh, in, in different towns and, 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 and villages, and, and they do uh, socio, socio, socio drama, which is uh, uh, probably you are familiar with, with, the, with the psychodrama, with uh, using dramatic uh, 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 action or enacting to, to heal uh, uh, a person or, or ourselves. Socio drama is, is applied. Uh, the method is similar, but it's applied to communities, to how to heal societies. They, uh, they do documentary theater, they do workshops, community art projects, educational projects and publications, and they have a website with PowerPoint presentations, and I do recommend. This is just the tip of the iceberg of their amazing work. Uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, within this beautiful network of, of dedicated professionals uh, trying to empower marginalized Romani communities in rural Hungary is, is the Sivhang company, which is, I don't know, hard sand or hard beat company that uh, grew out of uh, a, docu a documentary project. It started with a digital storytelling and research. Uh, it also had a social drama uh, a project supporting uh, unemployed uh, Romani women through uh, enacting their, their, their stories, uh, their stor stories in, 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 Hungary, in the Hungarian healthcare. How uh, they were not allowed, uh, just some of the many stories, uh, uh, they were not allowed to stay in the hospital, and, uh, and then they had to take their ill child in, and, and they were refused to be given a bed just to stay there. Their, their horrendous birth stories and all that they all those uh, situations they had to endure just because of their race, just because uh, of of, of, uh, of the color of their skin, just because they're these prejudices. So the. Uh, uh, this is uh, the photos, by the way, are taken by Gabriela Chosso, who's a who's a photographer, and she she's also an activist. And she, for instance, she ran uh, uh, photo workshops for Romani communities. But the photos you can see over here is not developed from this uh, uh, social drama situation. Uh, they took it to the to. To, to the next step, or, or they decided to, to, to move it forward and create a verbatim or docudrama from those situations that this social, social drama uh, 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 activities uh, threw up, they, they folded that into, into a piece of artwork. So that was the moment when the, when the, uh, when the, when the director and the, and the dramaturg helped shape uh, these stories into, into a, a performance, but the performers remained the, the self-same women who told those stories. And it's, it's called Long Live Re uh, Regina, and the story is about uh, women cooking in a kitchen, uh, getting ready for the birthday party of one of the, uh, uh, the, the women who is a bit late, and they recall her life, and they recall their own stories, and these are stories of birth, of giving birth, and hospital uh, experiences. So I'd like to just scroll through some of the photos uh, of, of this performance. And, and they peel the potatoes and cook the meal in front of us, and they sing, and they dance, and they share horrendous, horrendous stories of, of, of uh, Institutional abuse. I have no better word for that. Uh, but but through these stories, they are also empowered, and they they turn this into. They not only recognized what uh, the injustice, but they also 
they 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 voiced it and they 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 created an artistic format to share that uh, with with uh, with the world. And uh, in uh, in May you could see it in, in Germany, uh, and and they they toured with with the show. They took it to local communities as well to to, to be, be festivals. Uh, also. Uh, Another theatre company that is part of this loose web of wonderful professionals uh, using uh, action research in order to empower uh, communities is uh, called European Freaks. Oh, sorry, Stereo Act, and their production is called European Freaks. And as you, as you probably know, Brexit gives us a headache in Britain and in in, in Europe. So we. Uh, We've been traumatized in the past three years, and it's it's a criminal act. That's, that's probably we can agree on that. So what what Stereo Act decided? It's a, it's a Hungarian company who 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 created a, a performance where they survey various European uh, um, communities, and they work with a local focus group who are part of. So each city they go to, they harvest a focus group, and they work with that focus group who are part of the performance, and they use, uh, uh, and the audience is also part of the performance, and they collect the audience's uh, op opinion about the problems of, of Europe. The, the framework is that these are those actors, you see they are humanoids, who want to reboot Europe 2.0. So they are collecting and harvesting information from <laughs> European citizens in order to learn what uh, what are what Europeans are like, and and also to improve that and, and get a better Europe. So they collect, uh, they harvest this information from the uh, from the audience members, and they try to digest that and and and, and use it. But obviously, uh, this artificial intelligence this this fails and and and, uh, and they deduct uh, wrong consequences from from info, uh, from uh, wrong information and and also what what happens here that with the help of the focus group and with the help of the audience they help us rethink uh, the idea of, of the european union uh, something that uh, uh, grew out of uh, the devastation of war and and and, uh, and it was a, a beautiful project to to unite the countries of Europe in peace and and in prosperity. And now uh, you play the the, the ensemble, which is Beethoven's nice uh, uh, Ode to Joy, and people we. We, we don't even recognize. We have no idea that this is our European anthem. So okay, let's let's spice this up. Let's uh, let's uh, let's. Uh, uh, Let's change that. They they try to change the uh, the flag to make it more interesting, <laughs> and uh, and also they share stories where 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 they they share their own personal betrayals, their personal corruption, their personal uh, 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 prejudices. Where where we where we see that what we criticize in our politicians, we have it in a, in a personal level. So th this show this throws up so many questions about our European identity. And the problems we are grappling with. That uh, uh, so so that that's another way of using action research in order to empower communities. And now all I have to do is is, is play uh, a two minutes uh, a two minutes uh, excerpt for well it's is their trailer just to give you a flavor of of this performance and and and, and uh, reassure you that we are free that.
Jessica Carmichael is professor, director, dramaturg, and playwright. Um, they're going to talk to us on the subject of reflective pack practice. I the package on reflective practice using two case studies as a reference point. Give it up for Jessica, everybody. I was looking through pictures today, and I was like, oh, I should talk about Jordy. 
Um, so I just chose uh, an artist that I, I work with a lot of different artists, um, and Jordy's um, a wonderful playwright that I worked with, and I'm going to get to in a moment. Um, so I, I just decided to work with someone that's non-Indigenous, um, but with uh, an intersection with my practice as um, an, an Indigenous artist who has Euro roots, who's looking at the tensions between my Western training and my heritage. Um, and I thought this might be a good case for that. Um, I feel like all my dramaturgical support, uh, and I call it support, um, I think we've used some other words, I feel like they're all akin, um, is uh, whether it's new work or an adaptation or a devised community-based project, um, it's about allowing playwrights to embody their connections to the self, to the land, to their personal histories, to traditions, and how they bring this embodiedness, this awareness, um, to deepen their work and their understanding of what their own practice is. So my main goal always um, in dramaturgy is for the playwrights to lead it. Um, I'm there to facilitate a relationship to themselves and to their inner and outer worlds and support the play becoming more like itself. That's usually what I always say, I just want to help it make it more like itself. What does that mean? Uh, <laughs> to begin with, I'd like to um, share a few quotes on dramaturgy that I turn to often as I consider and refine my own reflective practice and how I offer it to playwrights. Um, the first one is from Ghostlight, an introductory handbook to dramaturgy by Michael Chambers. When I was at RADA, it was a book that my <laughs> dramaturgy teacher gave me, it's still on my shelf. Um, and Chambers says, and I quote, dramaturgy is about creation, finding appropriate methods of investigation for the process. And Chambers furthers this position in investigating by pointing out, and I quote, that asking questions is the beginning of a process that has as its goal the creation of a true artistic connection, end quote. For me, that investigation and connection comes out in offering a conscious, reflective practice to the playwright. This literally means enabling thoughtful time for deep inquiry, whereby a playwright has agency to dialogue with their imaginations, their histories, their unconscious, their biases, their homes, their forgotten lands, their futures, etc. And indeed, as I refine this practice, which I hope to expand on a little bit later, I think a lot about how to enable creation that takes up some of what Indigenous scholar Jill Carter's thoughts um, that she shares in her essay on scripting survivance from performing indigeneity where she discusses the sovereign exercise of creative agency that enables a remembering where we, and I quote, begin to privilege the imagination of human relationships, family, community, and that which transcends and underlines human meaning systems, end quote. So, taking all of that, <laughs> so I want to try and think about in terms of my relationships, um, I'm gonna to turn to Joy. There she is. Um, and Jordi worked on a play um, that became This Will Be Excellent. Um, and Jordi was, uh, when I was the artistic director of Carousel Players in Ontario for three seasons, um, Jordi became the 2015-2016 playwright in residence uh, with Carousel. And um, this was supported by the Ontario Arts Council. She and I wrote a, a collaborative grant together. Um, and Jordi's play um, is about well, lots of things, <laughs> but it's about um, youth at school, and the play asks, is one teaching method appropriate for all students? Mm -hmm. And how do we support all our kids at home and at school? So this is one of two driving questions that she centered in on as we were working together. Um, we began talking in January 2015. Um, it was like January 14th. I was looking at an email today. We're, we're good friends. We know each other from Montreal, actually. Um, and she called me and um, was following some of the work. I had been appointed to the company. And, and um, I said, she said, I don't really know what I want to do. I've never written for young audiences. This is a theater for young audiences. And I said, that's, that's great. <laughs> and I think, you know, you know, young audiences are old audiences. They're everything audiences. And um, you can think about that. And so we just started talking on the phone. And that's one of the things I often do with playwrights. I just, um, make time to have an hour or two hour conversation or longer. And that's sort of where we began. We just talked to each other. And I, I spent, my big thing is listening. 
and that's what Jesse is saying, radical listening. So I just listened, sat in my comfy chair with a tea at night, and Jordi and I talked about her life. Um, and I just asked her questions without really even knowing if she was going to write a play, what she was going to do. And so we just talked about her childhood, movies that she liked, um, school, her really mar getting married, all sorts of things. And we did this for a while, and I would take notation. And so I started to pick up on themes, things that she would circle back around to. So that's what I was listening for. What is she, what is she talking about? And then I would feed that back to her. And through that um, time and exchange together, just on the phone, so it's a different kind of embodiment, um, Jordi realized that she wanted to tell a story about something personal to herself, because she was sharing these personal stories about her own uh, time as an adolescent growing up uh, in a school system where she felt like she was a failure. Funny enough, because she's a smart cookie, but she felt like she did not, she was not supported. And she felt like if she had gone back, she wished she had had someone to talk to about maybe learning in a different way. Um, so from there, we decided that she needed to do more research. That was a big thing, is what went, went next. And so I thought, well, more thinking, <laughs> more research. Um, what do you want to do? It's always how I lead. What do you want to do? Well, I want to keep talking and thinking. Great. And so um, I suggested, because I had connections with carousel players, that maybe Jordi would enjoy uh, going into some schools and sitting and doing some observation work with some um, colleagues that I knew who I felt like would be happy to have her there and dialogue with her and, and that she could be in a safe place also to maybe talk with some students. So she decided to observe a grade six and an eight class at 20 Valley High School in Niagara. And she did that a couple times. Uh, and then she found a contact out of that in Toronto, which was closer to where she was living. And then she went into some high schools there and did some observations again for grade six and eight. And she started to realize that's really the age group that she was interested in. And what she did in the meantime when she did those observations, she would then just call me and tell me what she saw. So we'd have these conversations and she'd just talk all about things that she saw and I would just listen, take notes. And that would be our session. Um, and then afterwards, uh, I would send her sometimes because she would just want to do stream of conscious. I would send her the notes of things that she had taken away. And then after that, we said, what can we do next? And we said, maybe, maybe we need to put the research on its feet a bit. She said, okay, I've got some characters I'm thinking about, <coughs> thinking about. So that sounds great. So I'm going to go do that. Could we do some research time together? I was like, yeah. Do you want to do it with actors? Sure. Okay. So what we um, ended up doing, how do I do this? Just like, push it. <laughs> so, so we... So we did two different sessions. This is workshop pictures, I think, for the second session. Um, so we, we did two different sessions where we brought in actors to work with us um, and look at research that Jordy had. And that also involved maybe reading some of the script, maybe not, whatever she had. So um, the first group, and um, just back there, I think, for a second. The first group and the second group together, um, Jordy chose all the actors. So I, let, I said, you know, I, who do you love? So again, it was about lead, letting her lead. Who do you want to work with? I want to work with Payson Rock, and I want to work with Richard Lee, Richard Lamb, and I want to work with um, Jacob Amen, and I want to work with Cher Lichter. Great. Let's bring them in. So we did that for the first workshop. They're not featured. And then the second time around, um, she asked me if there were some people she felt that I felt like were great actors in workshop mode. Sometimes that can be hard. <laughs> we need people who want to make take creative risks. And so that's something she and I talked about. The first group definitely did, but we thought we would switch it up a little bit. So we brought in Sabrin Rock, Payson's sister, and Tara Kohler, who had done a lot of workshopping with me, and I knew she's gonna, she's a spitfire, she's gonna do great stuff. So we Cleland and Jeff Young's arm there with the purple <coughs> felt pen. Um, and, and both teams did similar things. We watched like a CBC documentary about high school students, and we talked about it, and Jordy just sat and listened to us. Um, and Jordi and I decided that before I sent her this CDC documentary. I was like, oh, maybe you'd like this. That's something I do as dramaturg. Do you want to watch this thing? Yes, I do. Oh, I watch this other thing. Will you watch this thing? I'll watch this thing. So we do that together. And then I said, why don't we have the actors watch that thing <laughs> and talk about it? So we agreed, yeah. Um, we had them uh, do the whole play on its feet, which terrified Jordi, what she had. And I was like, let's just do it. Bang. 
out of the gate. <laughs> and that was really informative for her to go away and think about how the play lives. We had the actors work on pressure, the word pressure, and I just asked them to build um, physical um, scenes around what it means to feel pressure as human beings. And so they were paired up, and Jordi and I would leave the room and go talk about things that she was thinking about, and we'd make them just do stuff for us. And then we'd come back in and watch it, and go, thank you, that was great. <laughs> and tell, let them tell us about what they were thinking about in terms of that process. Um, I think this one, we're, yeah, we're, we're making a word map around ages 11 to 12 emotions. Oh, just writing. What was that like for you? Um, we, later on, we brought in a, the second workshop, we actually did bring in a designer. Um, Anahita Devoni, I think I'm saying her last name right, um, and she, I said, want to bring in a designer? Okay. And so we just fooled around with like building the world of the play, building it in different configurations, building swing sets, building seesaws, because it could, maybe it was going to take place in a playground, maybe it was going to be in a school. And Jordi had never written a play that wasn't just in one room. So she was, she was expanding herself, and she just didn't know what that meant. So I said, why don't we try just building different environments and just having the actors walk through those environments and they can improv or do things, and you can think about that. Um, so we just saw a lot of different things. And one of the things that I also um, shared, and something that I do with a lot of playwrights, individually or sometimes in group sessions like this, is I also offered um, what I call what I've stolen, I don't call it this, but I do call it this now, authentic movement. And it was taught to me by a wonderful teacher by Teddy Taffel, who lives here yes. in Montreal, and she's, yes, she's the best, <laughs> and changed my life. And um, I studied authentic movement with her and mind and body at National Theatre School um, when I was an actor, and because we all do so many things. And um, Teddy, at that time, Teddy, it was about myself, the actor, um, and anyone else in the space, closing our eyes and working from where you're at in an authentic place and following impulse after impulse after impulse that Im that, of images that come to you and you move to them. That's, I guess, in a nutshell what it is. And you can move either pedestrianly <coughs> or expressionistically. And you, it's about getting out of your own way and getting in touch with your inner life, your inner imagination, and following those impulses and moving. Um, and so, Teddy, I've taken workshops with her since I graduated from NTS. And I told her, I've bastardized <laughs> your, your practice. Because what I do now is I use it with playwrights. And, and playwrights had taken that work. But I said, what I, what I ask them to do, or even actors in the processes where I'm a director, I say, I get them to be the character. So they drop in and breathe everything they know about the character. Or for a playwright, everything they know about the play. Everything you know to date about the play. Just today, I would say. It's going to change tomorrow, right? So just today, what do you know? And we're going to move from that place for 25, 30, and hour and you're not gonna open your eyes. And you're just gonna breathe if you get lost, and you're gonna move. And so in this group, we did that, and Jordy participated. So the actors had spent three days workshopping the world of the play, and at the end of it I said, let's just get up, and everybody in their own space, and I'll make sure no one bumps into walls, and you can move. And let's move from what this world has meant to us over these few days. And so everybody did that. And everybody at the end of it, you write. You just have a stream of consciousness and you write um, things that, Matt, that that came up. And in this process, those actors shared that with Joy. So that was the end of that practice for her. Um, here we are. We're happy. <laughs> so that was positive. Um, and that was that was still, I, I guess, uh, I should have said my focus right now is I'm talking about new play development. I do a lot of different things, but this is particularly for new play development. Um, and I find, you know, obviously every player is different, and they, they do different things. And I'm different when I meet them, I guess. I, I change, but there are certain things that I that I feel like these are this is what I know. This is what I can offer. Um, and majority that was a positive experience at the beginning, so that she could then go away, and she did. She started writing, and then things started changing in terms of what she needed from me, which was that I needed to deeply read the script, and I needed to read it moment by moment, and then I would send her. Not exhaustive notes at the beginning, because I didn't want to overwhelm her, um, but I would send her notes like, this is what moves me. This is strong. This is uh, a moment that's exciting. I can't get this out of my head. This is what I think your play is about. This is the heart of the play. And 
here are the key lines in the play that tell me that. This is what the structure is. This is the spine of the play. This is what happens, this is what happens, this is what happens. And then I'd send her little notes like, so what are you avoiding? What are you not writing? Or I'd write to her and say, what are you watching right now? Mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you eating? What are you tasting? Can you listen to, what kind of music are you listening to? I'm listening to this, she sent me. Can you just listen to that and write a draft? Yeah. What happens if you change this character and the scene and put it at the top of the play? I hate you, Jess. Okay. Don't do that. <laughs> so, those, so, so that was our process all the way through. And at that point, when she was my, we actually spent two years because she ended, stopped being the, we had no more money. So she stopped being the playwright in residence. But um, we still had some workshop money at Carousel when I was the AD. So I was like, let's work together um, and keep working on this. But my caveat was, um, I think that would be more right, is that I did not over the play. And so the big thing for me, when I was at Carousel anyways, and I, I hope, you know, that's what I was in part as a dramaturg to playwrights, is that I don't own it. I care deeply and I'm your cheerleader. But even if I'm like the AD of a company in dramaturging, in that position of power, that I don't own it. The most important thing is you figure out where you want your play to be and it might not be here. She ended up thinking it was going to be with our company. So we ended up producing it in 2017, 2018. 2018, uh, February, so I was already here when that happened. Um, so it was a long journey of, of phone calls and work, and we brought in a director um, to help get into that process, and so then things changed in terms of production dramaturgy, which I don't have time to talk about. And I forgot to put my timer on. So, <laughs> I'm just going to speak, can I speak briefly about this? Is that annoying? Um, so I teach at Concordia. And I thought this was just, I just wanted to explain a little bit more about reflective practice. Um, I teach playwriting and creation there. And so these are my playwrights in the room and I'm kind of trying to decolonize the space and we spend more time on the ground. We do a lot of embodied uh, authentic work at the beginning of our time together. Um, I, I teach playwriting one and two, so the courses are a little bit different. Um, just quickly, the structure, I guess, for playwriting one, which I'm just finishing tomorrow. With my students, um, where they're like, 16 plays that they wrote, and it's so great. Um, but they they do adaptation with me. So I start with uh, them trying to understand somebody else's voice, and the fact that a lot of playwrights often write back to the playwrights, and that in our current culture, sometimes we look back and we talk about now. Uh, you know, Sarah Rule does that, and um, Brandon Jacob Jenkins. There's some great playwrights, and Carson. And they, so we read a lot of plays, we read a lot of plays, because I think dramaturgy is about, and playwriting is about reading as well, um, and thinking. And we do a lot of writing exercises, but they also have assignments, and one of their assignments is to write a credo. So they write a manifesto right out of the gate about what they believe, what are they passionate about, and they can be contradictory. And they have to write, you know, a page, maybe too little, 25 pages, great about some th things they care about and I get them to start there and meanwhile they're doing you know authentic movement they're they're relating to land they're relating to words like home in the class they're doing little exercises writing sonnets about almonds and then they they do a pitch about an adaptation they want to do and they have to answer some very specific questions um, that I ask them, because I'm mean, maybe, in this particular dramaturgical role, because I think of myself as a dramaturge when I teach them, especially in the latter half of the class. I, I really think of myself as dramaturging 16 plays, um, which maybe seems like a little crazy <laughs> in the amount of time that I have, but, you know, it's important, um, because most of them have never written before, and I feel like part of dramaturgy is to get them to write, to love writing, and to keep writing. And especially with the workshops that I just talked about, for me it's about, here's an artistic wave and get on it and ride. How can we make your imagination go and keep writing? And so with these playwrights, they've had to do the same where they pitch a play and they have to answer questions like, what's at stake? What's the heart of your play? Can you write out the story in one sentence? They're like, I don't even know what it is, have you written it? But I make them do that at the beginning so that they're thinking about it. Then they do a bake off with me that's based on Paula Bogle, who doesn't know her, um, and 
Um, her wonderful Bake Off is um, basically a 24-hour playwriting competition where people write a play in 24 hours with a bunch of ingredients, and at the end of it, they read them, and everyone just applauds. That's it in a nutshell. For my students, they do it over a week. They get a week to do it in 24 hours over a week because they got lies. And I give them ingredients, which is what Paula does as well. Their ingredients are always related to the content of the play. So because we read the seagull, I write in the ingredients, there must be a seagull. Or there must be one moment of absolute chaos. Drunkenness. Um, there must be an object that is sacred. Um, must be also uh, one impossible ask, because we talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. Playwrights writing impossible asks. Um, and then they come in and they get to eat, <laughs> and they write their plays, and then they hand them in. Um, and then after that, we workshop every single one of them. They each get a 50 minute slot, which doesn't seem like a lot, but they come and they meet me one-on-one, -on -one, and they talk to me about how that was, what, what the rough draft is like, and, and because they had to write it, like I made them write it in 25 pages only, or, or you know, and they had to add a seagull, and they're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't like that. And I said, now you get to cut it. It was just to get you out of your way. Get out of your way and write. And then after that, now it's about opening yourself up and writing the play that's more like yourself. So tell me about that play. So they sit in my office and they tell me about the play. And I ask similar questions like I asked George, what are you afraid of writing? What's this play about? Why aren't you writing that play? Um, and then we talk about the workshop and they cast their, they cast it and we, or they say to me, I mean, I, I want to have it read. And I go, never underestimate just hearing it read. It's huge. Just hearing your play read because it's hard to hear it read. Sometimes you need to hear it twice because you can't even hear it the first time. <laughs> and we do that. And sometimes after that, if we have time, we usually do. Um, the students will let me lead them in dramaturgy questions like what bubbles, what excites you, and the class will feed that back in written response. But we'll also sometimes have quite conversations, um, kind of similar to what I did with Jordy, where this past week we talked about moon rocks. One of the students is writing a play with moon rocks and time travel. And so we asked everyone, what do you think about rocks? And everyone just talked about rocks for 15 minutes. And I wrote up all the responses for the playwright on the board and just took a picture of it at the end. And then another playwright just wanted to watch this wonderful Japanese cartoon for basically the entire 15 minutes. I said, amazing. And then at the end, he showed beautiful pictures that he had drawn in response because he just can't write right now. He can only draw his play and showed them. And then he asked, can everyone just write some responses to my pictures? And that was the workshop. So again, it's really led by that. Um, there's one last picture. I think I'm definitely at time. Um, <laughs> and I think all I just want to leave is, I think I already said it, that I think for me, the point, because I love playwrights too, I'm obsessed with them. I love theater. I think that dramaturgy is about deep inquiry and, and real love for the work. Um, and, and that it's about, for me, it's really about being a cheerleader. That's how I think of myself. I think of myself completely there to support the playwright and challenge them um, once I get to know them. But it's also about that, that it's a long-term relationship that I'm going on with them until after the play is open, whether I'm still attached to that play or not, or if another dramaturg came in, because I think that's also important sometimes for playwrights, to mix it up and to not be precious about it, but that you're still at the very end going, huzzah. Whether it gets an opening or not, because I agree it doesn't always need to. But whatever they do with it, whether they turn it into a book or they, they just share it with their friends and family, you know, or that it just ends in class, but that they go, I wrote.